this morning. I'm going to share three readings with you. First from Isaiah chapter 55, just a few verses here, 6 through 11. Uh, Isaiah wrote, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the evil man his thoughts. Let him turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on him. And to our God, for he will freely pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are, are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish, so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish that which I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. And then a couple of verses, Jeremiah 29, verses 11 to 13. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. And then our gospel reading for the week is John chapter 12, verses 20 to 33. Now there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the feast. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, with a request. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. Philip went to tell Andrew, and Andrew and Philip in turn told Jesus. Jesus replied, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. The man who loves his life will lose it, while the man who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servants also will be. My Father will honor the one who serves me. Now my heart is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, please save me from this hour? No, it was for this very reason that I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice from heaven, I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd that was there and heard it said it had thundered. Others said an angel had spoken to him. Jesus said, this voice was for your benefit, not mine. Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. But I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. He said this to show the kind of death he was going to die. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word, and, and as we look into that word this morning, we pray for your spirit to help us understand it and to draw strength from it. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hang us up a little bit here. You ever thought about the importance of land? We often take our land for granted, I think, and I'll explain that in a little bit, but some people define themselves to some extent by the little plot of land they own. They, they improve it, they try to improve it at least, they try to make it look nice and be functional, take care of it, we try to control land use. We uh, either use it for agricultural use or industrial or commercial or residential. Um, but largely, we do, I think, tend to take it for granted. The land is simply that which everything else we own sits on. And other than mowing it every week or planting a few flowers, we don't really think that much of it. We tend to take it for granted. Whatever house or whatever factory or commercial building, whatever building we might have, sits on the land and the very foundation of whatever we build extends down into the land. And our buildings and improvements are either firm and solid or, or faulty, largely due 
to how good the land is and, and how deep our extension, our, our deep, our foundations go down into the land. Still, we tend to take our, our land for granted. Foundations are important. Certainly the foundation of our faith is incredibly important. Uh, Matt, uh, Jesus said in Matthew 21, verse 42, the stone the builders have rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Jesus has become the cornerstone of our faith. Jesus is the foundation that we build our faith on. So foundations are, are, are extremely important. And even in land use, foundations are extremely important. Now, of course, if we're in the agriculture business, if we're farmers, we can't take the land for granted, can we? Um, farmers make their living off the land. They have to take care of it. They, have to, they can't afford to take it for granted, whether for farming or for crops or raising cattle or whatever other activities they engage in. The land is vital to, the, to their success. The quality of the soil, how much water it has, how much fertilizer it gets, uh, how it's tilled and prepared and plowed. All of these things are, are very important to the success of, of farming activities. Land is important, and how we use land is important. Land is important in scriptures as well. God created the land on the third day of creation. Before that, the world was covered with water. Genesis 1 verse 9 says, And God said, Let the water under the sky be gathered to one place, and let the dry ground appear. And it was so. And God called the dry ground land, and the gathered waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Immediately after that, God said, Let the land produce vegetation, seed-bearing plants and trees in the land, that bear fruit with seeds in it, according to their various kinds. And it was so. The land produced vegetation, plants bearing seed according to their kinds, and trees bearing fruit according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. And the last day of creation he made mammals to live on the land, animals to live on the land. Verse 24 says that uh, let the land produce living creatures according to their kind, livestock, Creatures that move along the ground and wild animals, each according to its kind. And it was so. Then after everything else was made, after all creation was complete, he created man and woman in his image. You know, kind of a tongue-in-cheek way to look at this is that maybe with the foresight that he had, he quit there because he saw what a mess we would make of things. Could that be, could that be it? That's not the reason at all that man was made last. Mankind was made last because he saved the best for last. He made us in his image, and we're special in his eyes. He has a special love for us. He longs for us to desire a relationship with him as well. He longs for us to love him in return. He has a plan for us and for our lives. What an incredible plan that would be if we would just get out of the way and let him work sometimes. In Isaiah 55, we saw that uh, my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. His thoughts are so much higher than ours. His plans, so much better than our plans. His, his ways, so much higher than our ways. Yet, still, we try to hang on to our lives and do things for ourselves. We try to make our plans, thinking that we can, we can get it done. And, and we don't consider God and his plans. The reading in Jeremiah said, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Yet so often, we fail to see the results of his incredible plans because we end up getting in the way. Our greed, our fear, our unfaithfulness all interfere with God's plans, keeping God's plans from truly coming.
coming to fruition in our lives. We need to be listening to his voice. We need to be familiar with his word. We need to be following his every move. Or we aren't, if we don't do those things, we aren't pursuing the relationship that he desires to have with us. God created us last because he loves us the most. And he has a plan for us. And part of that plan is to tend for and care for the land. To use the land and to work with the land to produce food. Fruits and vegetables to sustain us. Livestock providing both milk and meat. Kind of an extension of this thought. You ever seen the movie The Lion King? Overall, that's a, 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 a bit mystical movie. Spiritually, there's not an awful lot to get from that movie. Uh, but I do like how the circle of life is explained. And, and we know that we're all a part of the circle of life, right? But in the movie, uh, it talks a little bit about how each animal lives and dies and is dependent on every other animal. Uh, there's a scene where Mufasa, the Lion King, at the beginning of the movie, takes uh, his little cub, Simba, the future king of, of the land of the tribe, pride, I guess, uh, on a tour of all the lands that he, that he rules over. Uh, Mufasa, Mufasa is trying to explain the, the circle of life, the role that each of the animals has in the kingdom. And, and obviously the lions depend on the zebras and the other animals uh, for food. But he warns them not to kill any more than you can eat because they have a role too. And, and if we haphazardly kill all these animals, then, then the land overgrows. And, and it gets, you know, we need to allow them to eat what they eat, to keep vegetation under control, to keep <coughs> insects and other vermin under control. Even the lion's food has a part in that system. It's not just to feed the lions. It's to keep other things under control. So you can only kill what they can eat. We know how the life cycle works, right? Animals live and die and each has a purpose. And, and by their death, they become food for others. Or they fertilize the land for others. Giving back to the land that sustained them in life. It's really an incredible system. They talk now about intelligent design rather than creation. It truly is an intelligent design, isn't it? Uh, it's an incredible system. Every life, plant or animal, has a role in the circle of life. The ecology of the land is an incredibly complex system. God created it wonderfully. And it's self-managed. If, if one area lacks, it kind of auto-corrects and comes right back to normal again. Um, we know how these things work. We know that they're true. We understand at least partially how this life, life cycle works. We know how wonderfully designed it is, how it sustains itself. Um, we know that even our farms, our land use in the long run operates best if we try to keep our environmental impact to a minimum, right? Farmers can tell you that they can water and they can fertilize and they can till the soil and they can plow, but much more than that is, is that's apt to cause problems as it is to do good. Uh, there's another part of the life cycle that's a little different thought, switching gears here a little bit. Another part of the life cycle that we also know is true, and that's that death is an essential part of the system. Jesus, in our reading from John, says in verse 24, I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Now, we have a number of seeds at home that we kind of harvested last year from our, especially our squash, but we have a number of seeds that we've taken from different plants and vegetables, and we dry them out, and then we put them away in an envelope until it's time to plant them again. And if you look at one of those things, they don't look like much. You know what a seed looks like. Doesn't look like a living thing, does it? Looks pretty dead. Doesn't look like there's anything going on. In fact, those seeds that we harvested back in September don't look a bit different today than they did then. 
But yet, we also know that if we plant one in the ground, it begins to change. It begins to grow. And it produces life. New life. Abundant life. That one seed will grow into a big plant and produce a number of other fruit or vegetables. Wow. And each one of those squash or tomatoes or whatever that seed is for will produce fruit with lots more seeds in it. We need to live and to grow according to his design. We need to play the role that he has designed us to play. We need to serve him where and when he's created us to serve, where he's opened up opportunities for us. And we have to have the confidence that, that what is written in his word is honest and true and will be in our best interest if we follow him. That our life will be better if we live according to his word. We know what Jesus said is true. And one of the things he said in this passage is that his death will produce life. Eternal life for you and me and countless others. Yeah, I heard it click on. Thank you, Leroy. At the beginning of the reading in John, and this is a totally different thought. Um, a final thought for today, actually. Uh, at the beginning of the reading, it said, Now there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the feast. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, with a request. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. Philip went to tell Andrew. And Andrew and Philip, in turn, told Jesus. What do you think they wanted why do you think they wanted to see Jesus? Why did they want to meet him? Why did they want to talk to him? That's something we'll probably never know. I have a suspicion. When Jesus was, in the, was being tempted in the, in the wilderness, when Satan was done tempting him after the last temptation, he left. But before he left, he said, I'll be back. Satan wasn't planning on just letting Jesus go to finish his ministry. Satan was going to continue tempting Jesus throughout his life. And I wonder if this time spent with these Greeks was intended to be another temptation. Something else that Jesus was going to have to be, uh, would be tempted with. So where do I get that idea? There was a David Beswick, a pastor from Australia, who wrote a book on the question titled, What if Jesus had gone to Athens. Wrote an entire book on that, on that question. I'm, I'm going to read a couple of paragraphs from the introduction here. It says, Might he have chosen the role of a teacher of wisdom in the tradition of the Greek philosophers like Plato or Aristotle? 
After all, he was a wise man, and many thought he had interesting things to say. How do you think they would have received him at the Agora in Athens, where debates of the philosophers still continued to this day? Or still, yeah, still continued at that time. Was that not a great way to spread his thinking? Paul did go there to speak and argue with the Athenians, Athenians for Christ. What if Jesus had accepted an invitation to teach in Athens instead of taking that last final step to Jerusalem? Athens or Jerusalem? Was it a real choice? I have no doubt that something like the role of a teacher of wisdom in the Greek tradition was a real option for Jesus. We don't really know what the Greeks said or what they expected, but we do believe, according to Christian tradition, that Jesus was tempted in every way we are. It was not very different from the ways of the worldly success that Satan suggested to him in his temptations in the wilderness. To survive and become a great teacher sought out by the wisest of men. And one who was even willing to teach a woman. That must have been a, a possible future for him. Whether the temptation came with these Greeks or otherwise, what would it have been like if Jesus had gone to Athens? Why didn't he go? Faced with certain death, if he makes the trip into Jerusalem, where he could go to Athens and live out the rest of his life as a great teacher. Our passage tells us very simply why he didn't go. He said, the hour has come. You know, at least three other times in the book of John, Jesus hesitates to do something or doesn't do something because he says, the hour has not come. It's not my time yet. Here, he says, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. And he goes from here to the journey into Jerusalem for Palm Sunday, what we celebrate as Palm Sunday next week. Wheat produces its own kind. It produces more wheat. Jesus saw his suffering and death in the same way. His death will produce eternal life for many others. So he embraced it willingly. And he died for you and me so we can have that eternal life. Trust in this. Have confidence in this. Accept that he died for you. Accept that he loves you and that he died for you. Accept that you will have eternal life. Death will come. One day we'll be returned to the land from which we came. But that death is a physical death, not a spiritual one. Nothing can take us away from the everlasting life to come. Let's pray. Father God, your word contains many promises. Help us to cling to this one, that Jesus' death opened the door for all of us to live forever. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.